this is a bit of a reunion for me. I uh, spent eight years in the U.S. Department of Defense under uh, President Clinton and Vice President Al Gore as the Deputy Under Secretary of Defense for Environmental Security. And one might, and I was often asked the question, well, what is environment that has to do with security? And how do the two connect? And I spent eight years working with many of you here in this room trying to establish those important connections. And it's so, it's a real pleasure to sort of see this work come now eight years after I left the government, come back uh, to gain some imp important discussion. Let me take us back a little bit now, uh, since it's, uh, we have the environmental, ecological, and security communities together here to recall that many militaries actually have strong environmental roots. Uh, I, I know those military leaders in, in here in the room will be able to share their stories uh, a little later on. I think back to the American explorers, Lewis and Clark, uh, who explored the American West. They were army officers. Uh, they also were among the country's greatest early naturalists, cataloging in their exploration uh, hundreds of species. And those strong traditions have continued uh, within the military, even though it is certainly true that uh, um, in recent years, the, in some countries, including my own, the military has been thought of as a, a polluter as much as a preserver. And certainly there are those conditions that have to be taken, taken care of. But if you think uh, in the United States, the military is the third largest federal landholder, and it has the greatest concentration of endangered species mm. of any federal lands. Um, and that's because the military lands largely have been protected uh, from development uh, and urbanization, and so they have become islands of nature. Um, and because in many countries, uh, like in the United States, the militaries are among the better funded institutions of the government. They have been able to develop capabilities of, uh, uh, we have hundreds of biologists and uh, naturalists and uh, environmental specialists and scientists um, within the U.S. Department of Defense. And I know that is true in many other countries uh, as well. And so that has added to sort of a core capability that I think can very productively be, be used. Now, um, when, when I was uh, in DOD, we tried to use this capability constructively to engage with militaries around the world uh, to address environmental issues. Now, at this time, back in the 1990s, I would say climate, climate change was somewhat on the agenda, but not nearly as high on the agenda as it is today. Um, at, at the time, many issues were associated with pollution and hazardous waste management and problems caused by the militaries in their own countries. We would use this as an engagement tool uh, working within NATO, um, with throughout the world, um, to try to build capabilities and uh, skills. Let me give you um, a couple of uh, examples. Uh, I worked uh, with all of the U.S. military commanders at that time to organize, combatant commanders around the world to organize environmental security engagement conferences. So, for example, um, when General Wes Clark was head of Southern Command, we held a conference um, to bring together the military leaders in Latin America as well as leaders of environmental ministries, um, many of whom had never actually gotten together before. Uh, so we, we were sort of providing a bridge for to exchange information um, and uh, to create some, some knowledge. Now, uh, an interesting story that you um, just related, Jeff, about the uh, Brazilian fear of the American military taking over the Amazon rainforest. You know, the, in the American military, nothing could be farther from their mind than that, but I must tell you, there was a story, when we held this conference, which actually was in Miami, there was one story that came out of the Brazilian press about how the U.S. military plans to take over the Amazon rainforest. <laughs> so 
Um, it clearly is a Brazilian concern, and it, it pointed up the importance of being sensitive to the different um, uh, different views of the military in in society and having that cultural sensitivity, which has not always been the case. And so there are some important learning um, that has to be done. But, um, <clears throat> in the Pacific Command, when Admiral Preer, later our ambassador to China, but head of the U.S. Pacific Command, he and I held in Hawaii a conference that brought together uh, leaders th th throughout the Pacific, military and environmental leaders. Um, we did the same in Central Command with General Zinni, um, and he really saw this as a way to have, uh, as to have dialogue about non-threatening issues, environment, as a way of engaging and building cooperation, trust, and understanding. So I think um, there's sort of a double benefit uh, in this opportunity to have constructive um, engagement on environment, both for to advance important environmental values and understanding of how better to uh, preserve our ecological conditions, but also um, as a way to develop preventive capacity and support larger societal values. Uh, we did some very important work in NATO, and I was pleased to hear from uh, Suzanne, uh, who is here from NATO, that that work continues. And I think there is, there is a real now an opportunity uh, to engage further uh, with NATO to begin to think about how to integrate understanding uh, and work that's done in the security community within NATO forums. In fact, she brought with her a copy of a report I helped sponsor uh, almost to 12 years ago, I think, or 10 years ago, on uh, environment and security in an international context. And we also did a work on environmental guidelines for the military sector that was to apply. It was a NATO document to be applied for militaries um, around the world. Um, and uh, as Jeff has already noted, there are some important needs arising as climate change is happening today, increased likelihood um, of uh, humanitarian disaster. Uh, humanitarian action and disasters that will will demand, uh, because there are no other forces capable of responding so rapidly, the militaries around the world, um, as they are often sort of the global first responders. Um, but it also points up the importance of reaching in many ways beyond just the military to develop capacities within other government organizations. Uh, and develop public-private partnerships that will enable us better to respond to those challenges. So Vooter asked me to speak a little bit about uh, how we think about war, war gaming and scenario planning and how the, the communities, the environment and security communities might be able to come together on this. So let me say that these conferences I just referred to that we conducted in the 90s with military leaders were often done on the basis of a, a potential scenario, something that might go wrong that would require the military to respond. Um, and it could be a conflict uh, occurring. It could be, um, in fact, we just, co uh, my think tank just co-sponsored earlier this year uh, a war game on climate change, uh, the first one that we have participated in, which presumed um, certain natural disasters occurring that sort of step up the awareness of the international community to try to get an international agreement, as well as to focus on some of the key parts of adaptation needed in climate change, dealing with migration as natural disasters and resource scarcity. So in the environmental community, particularly the conservation community, you have a lot of important data and evidence about ecological conditions. Um, in fact, I had the pleasure of sitting in just a little while ago with Glenn Prickett and the, the uh, uh, business community talking about this new integrated data assessment tool for business. But I would say that it has equal application and, you, and environmental scientists have a lot of data to bring that can be used better to understand ecological conditions from the, from the ground up that could be used in looking at various scenarios um, uh, that could occur around the world, whether it's um, the flooding and sea level rise likely to occur in Bangladesh, 
the glacial melting occurring um, in the Himalayas leading to flooding, uh, the natural disasters, the various scenarios in the Arctic, which in my view is just in increasingly important and we actually have an opportunity, I think, in the next, uh, in the next few years to set the stage for long-term cooperation rather than competition in that region um, as the Arctic melts. But it, it is important to sort of bring these communities together uh, and to use these tools. And I think that the conservation community has a lot to offer here. Um, so I would uh, um, offer up a couple of, rec a couple of recommendations that um, I'm going to tribute part of this to our, one of our colleagues from the U.S. who could not be here, uh, uh, Shannon Beebe, and thanks to whom my colleague Dave Katerius, who will in a few minutes have a battlefield promotion to talk about um, our, our project on climate change and national security. But in thinking through how IUCN might engage with the security community, um, one suggestion is to think about creating a task force with NATO and other security experts to develop some kind of global environmental security survey tool, something that might build off the concepts of IBAT, but for governments it, and to look at how this could be used as developing the sound evidence and data needed to develop these kind of long-range planning scenarios that one could then do exercises or what are called war games with. And that would have benefits both in sort of expanding the evidence-based understanding of those conditions, but also bringing the communities together to actually do those, you know, exercises and do that joint learning. Um, it's also a sound basis for cooperative engagement. Um, second, I, you know, I think IUCN could offer to NATO and, uh, and also to other military commands. I, I think back to my days in the, in the U.S., I would have loved to have this when I was working with our military commanders to assist in developing these ecological dimensions of the military planning exercises and war games because it's not well understood. Mm -hmm. And so oftentimes it's not exercised because you don't know how to develop the scenario and the evidence based on it. Mm -hmm. But there is increasing awareness, um, certainly in the U.S. and I think in other militaries around the world, that um, climate change, energy security, global environmental degradation are conditions that have important security dimensions that must be understood. And one of the um, great assets of military organizations um, that all the military leaders in this room know well is that you do long-range planning uh, and strategic planning. And that's very important, I think, as we're dealing with the longer-term threats of climate change to be able to think longer term and do that long-range planning so you can understand not only what's going to happen five years from now, but what might be likely scenarios 20 years from now and 25 years from now so you can begin to understand the urgency of making those changes now. Um, so I want to just, cl I want to close by um, saying that um, 70 years ago, in, in 1938, my parents, who were both born in Germany, uh, fled. Um, and they were lucky to get out, and many of um, their relatives did not and perished um, in the Holocaust. And it was, um, you know, in, 19, in the 1930s, it was, I think, hard for many people to see the future um, and to take action to protect themselves. But today, we know with reasonable confidence that our future will bring more migration as people seek higher ground uh, from sea level rise and inundation, uh, seek better, seek better uh, ways to, to find the food that will become less productive uh, in many parts of the world, and shelter. And it will bring um, more natural disasters, some caused by climate change. Uh, but we can together act to reduce the numbers of people that will lose their homes and livelihoods, their families and their communities. And we can together act to give our countries and communities a more sustainable future. And we can together 
act to provide a better world for our children and our grandchildren. And I think that is really um, our collective responsibility and one that I hope uh, our communities can undertake together. Thank you.